Good afternoon. So today, as the uh, penultimate session here, I'm going to talk about the topic that's going to utilize everything you have learned so far. A little replication, a little pathogenesis, um, some retrovirology, a little epidemiology, and we're going to use all of that to talk about a story involving what may be a new human retrovirus called VEX-MRV. So this starts, this whole story starts with prostate cancer. Prostate cancer is uh, a disease that, that occurs in two forms. There is a sporadic form of the disease where the prevalence increases with age. So a risk factor is age. And then there is a familial form where genetics is involved and you're predisposed to developing the cancer depending on what's been present in your family and this is typically early onset less than 55 years old. A number of studies have shown that perhaps another risk factor for prostate cancer is a mutation in RNA cell. So RNA cell, remember, it's a interferon stimulated gene product that's involved in cutting up the genomes of incoming viruses. And uh, in particular, this R462Q variant was thought to have, be associated with an increased risk for having prostate cancer, all right? Now, this mutation actually decreases the catalytic activity of the RNAs, so it makes it less efficient at chopping up RNA. So some of the ideas w for how this mutation might predispose you to prostate cancer, maybe it makes, maybe it has an anti-apoptotic effect. And so you don't normally clear precancerous cells and therefore they prog progress to cancer. Or another idea was that maybe this mutation allowed you to be infected with a virus which then led to prostate cancer. All right, so the original idea for looking for a virus uh, etiology of prostate cancer was this mutation in RNA cell. All right, so a group, uh, actually a multi-center group, decided to do this and what they used was a microarray technology. This is a figure from the textbook showing you how DNA microarrays work. In this experiment we are looking to see if a virus infected cell makes different mRNAs compared to an uninfected cell. Of course the viral mRNAs would be different but you want to know if in particular cellular mRNAs are turned on. So what you do is you make these arrays on glass slides uh, where a robot prints individual DNA sequences, hundreds and hundreds of them per slide. Then you can make RNA from your test subjects. It can be a virus infected cell or an uninfected cell. In the case today, it's a prostate tumor. We're going to make RNA from prostate tumors cut out of patients. Uh, you take the RNA, you make cDNA using reverse transcriptase, and you use a dye coupled triphosphate so that the DNA you make is labeled with a fluorescent dye. In this case, one is red and one is green, so you can distinguish viral DNA from cellular DNA. You then hybridize these um, DNAs to the slide. You can do this very readily, and then you excite the floors on the, that have stuck to the glass slide with lasers that excite at different wavelengths, and then you can take photographs or digitize these and analyze them. So in this experiment, if you have a red dot, it means that mRNA is induced. So each dot on the slide is a different sequence uh, referring to a cellular gene, say. So if you have a red dot, it means the mRNA is up. If you have a green dot, it means it's down because you have mostly cellular green here. And if it's yellow, that means the two are equal, there's no change, all right? So in this experiment, they did this with just DNA or RNA from prostate tumors. They do a microarray, and on the slide was not cellular mRNA, but viral sequences. And so this is called a virochip. It was developed by Joe DeRisi at UCSF. And this virochip contains the most conserved sequences 
of about 950 different viruses. So it's a scan to say what virus is in this sample. So they took RNA from tumor tissues. They took 19 different tumor tissues, which were collected at the Cleveland Clinic. And they extracted RNA, labeled them fluorescently, and hybridized them to this viral microarray. Okay, not a cellular microarray. It's all viral sequences because they want to know what kind of um, viruses might be in the prostate tumor. And so here's an example of the readout of a microarray. So here on the left is just part of it, and this is showing uh, 502 retroviral sequences that were on the chip. They're all viruses represented, but we're just looking at the retroviral sequences because that's in fact what they picked up. And these are the positive hybridization signals here. Each line is a different sequence. And going vertically, each VP is a different patient sample. So there are 19 patient samples. And you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of them are, or maybe seven, I think it was, are reacting with uh, retroviral sequences on the chip. So they're giving you a positive signal. And then they took these positive samples and did a PCR for a retroviral uh, gene. And this is the gag gene. And you can see these are all confirmed positive as well. So this is a typical readout of a microarray. Now, here are the numbers. So they got a positive signal in 7 of 11 tumors, homozygous for this variant, so RQ, so it's QQ. And those are the red ones here. Uh, and then they also got a positive signal in a heterozygous variant. So in other words, the homozygous have both mutations in RNA cell, and the heterozygous only has one allele mutated. So 7 of 11 uh, for the RNA, RQ, RNA cell variant QQ. No positive signals in three tumors from RQ heterozygotes and uh, one positive in, in the wild type homozygote. All right? So that was a gamma retrovirus that they pulled out. And so what they did is they went back to some of the positive prostate tumors and they used PCR to amplify the entire viral genome from those samples. And this is what they got. On top is a diagram of the viral genome that was cloned from uh, one of these. And on this slide are shown genomes cloned from two different patients, VP35 and VP62. So this was cloned in two pieces, and this was cloned in a, in a number of different pieces here. And they sequence them, and they find a typical retroviral genome with the LTRs on either side. It encodes a GAG and a GAG pro Paul protein and an envelope protein from a spliced uh, messenger RNA. So they took this sequence and they just compared it to the entire database of viral sequences, which you can do very readily, and they find that it has very high identity with a number of other retroviruses of mice. All right, so these are all a variety of murine retroviruses. There are some uh, exogenous and endogenous viruses. So these ERVs are endogenous retroviruses. Those are proviral sequences that are present in the mouse genome. So they're called murine endogenous retrovirus. And then this tells you what chromosome of the mouse they are integrated into, chromosome 147, et cetera. So this new virus that they found in a prostate, in several prostate tumors, had high homology to murine retroviruses. And here's a phylogenetic tree of the sequence to show you that. And the red are the samples. There are three samples from prostate tumors, different patients, VP35, 62, and 42. So these three samples are identical, or virtually identical, one or two base differences. So you see 100% identity here. And then they're compared to a, a number of other retroviruses. Uh, you can see these are some endogenous retroviruses of mice and some exogenous one, Maloney, murine leukemia virus here, more endogenous. Uh, and then um, at the bottom, feline leukemia virus, gibbon ape leukemia virus, and koala retrovirus. These are more distant. So again, this shows that they're highly related to murine endogenous viruses, and in particular, what we call xenotropic murine viruses. Those are the ones with the X here. And so that's why the virus was called xenotropic murine leukemia virus related virus XMRV. So murine leukemia virus because it's related to these viruses of mice uh, and then xenotropic 
uh, is, a, is the name given to these certain kinds of murine leukemia viruses, which we'll talk about in a few moments. So this is how the RNA L genotype tracked with uh, XMRV. So this is showing you the PCR positive and negative for XMRV according to RNA cell genotype. Uh, the, the double, the homozygous mutant, the heterozygous, and the homozygous wild type. So you can see eight of twelve, uh, eight of uh, twenty positives out of um, the the homozygous mutant, the heterozygous, and the wild type. So according to this, it looks like the virus preferentially infects people with this RNA cell mutation. Turns out that that doesn't hold up subsequently, but that was one of the uh, interesting observations from this paper. So here is a section of prostate tumor to show you uh, the presence of this virus. These are, again, tumors sectioned and hybridized with nucleic acid probes derived now from XMRV. And these are tumorous tissues. You can see the H&E staining on the left here. And then uh, in the middle, these blue sections are showing you cells. Uh, the green dots are the viral hybridization signals. So this is called fluorescent in situ hybridization, or FISH, because the, the probes are labeled fluorescently. The cells are counterstained with a nuclear stain. The nucleus is blue. So you can see that these uh, viral probes are hybridizing with cells in the sections of prostate tumor. So this is one evidence that they set forth to show that this virus was actually infecting the tissue and was not a contaminant. And here they took a monoclonal antibody and stained those tissues as well. Again, they cut up prostate tumor tissues, stained them with a monoclonal antibody against the GAG protein. This is a structural precursor, remember, of spleen focus forming virus, another retrovirus. Uh, and this antibody is used because it reacts with a wide range of murine leukemia viruses, not only the xenotropic, but also polytropic and ecotropic, which we will define in a moment. And you can see uh, here the cells are staining red, and that's showing the presence of the viral protein. So the previous slide showed there was viral nucleic acid in the cells, in the prostatic tumor cells. Here uh, we see that there's viral protein uh, in the prostatic tumor cells as well. So the conclusions of this study, the XMRV detected in primary human tissues, no mouse sequences. They did a control looking for mouse gap DH. They weren't found. Infection seems to be restricted to samples with the QQ RNA cell genotype. They found polymorphisms in the virus from different patients, slight sequence variations, very minimal though, and they suggested this indicated that these were independent infections. Uh, Viral nucleic acids and antigens were detected in tumor tissues, so they conclude it's probably not a contaminant, and it's the first example of human infection with a murine leukemia virus. So this was the paper in PLOS Pathogens in March 2006. Uh, it was a collaboration between uh, the, the Derisi lab at UCSF and the Silverman lab at Cleveland Clinic, which provided the prostate tumor samples. Some of the questions raised by this study, first of all, this virus has no oncogene. You remember that many RNA tumor viruses are oncogenic because they have a, an oncogene in them, but the sequence of this one showed there's no oncogene. So how does it cause prostate cancer? Another interesting thing, which we didn't point out in the sections, but the genome is found in stromal cells, not the actual carcinoma cells in the prostate samples. Well, it's just is funny because you would assume that the viral genome is present in the tumor cells, and that's not the case. These data don't prove a link of the virus with cancer. They just show that there's an association. So you have to do much more than, than show an, an association of a virus with a certain disease. And finally, where did this virus come from? It's a murine virus, which we say is infecting people. So let's take a look at the virus before we go on. This is a retrovirus, of course, and it's a gamma retrovirus. So we talked in this course mainly about lentiviruses. Uh, the gamma retroviruses are different. They're prototypical retroviruses enveloped with glycoproteins in the envelope and, of course, two RNAs in the core along with reverse transcriptase integrase, RNase H, uh, and the protease. So this virus was eventually discovered, the actual virus, by taking that sequence, making a complete DNA copy of the viral genome, putting that into cells. I, didn't, I just added this this morning, so it's not in your printout. You know, I, got, I, I wanted to add a few things, but it's, it's just a picture of the virus. 
uh, and they transfected this DNA copy of the genome into cells, and viruses were produced, and these are the particles by EM. And these, again, are typical retrovirus particles, about 100 nanometers uh, in diameter. So gamma retroviruses are simple retroviruses. They only have a couple of genes as opposed to HIV, which are more complex. They're widespread in nature. They're found in mammals of all sorts, birds, reptiles. They can be spread as exogenous viruses, virus particles going from animal to animal, or they can enter the germline, become integrated, and be passed from uh, parent to offspring in the germline. So they're commonly transmitted vertically, mother to offspring, and they can initiate a viremia in the offspring when so transmitted. They cause a variety of diseases, leukemias, cancers, neurological degeneration, and immunodeficiency. When they do cause cancers, these arise by insertional activation of proto-oncogenes. Remember, RNA tumor viruses cause cancers in various ways, and one of them is to insert and activate next to a proto-oncogene. And when you get infected with these viruses, it's lifelong because it integrates into your uh, DNA, of course. So the murine leukemia virus, the endogenous murine leukemia viruses to which this XMRV is related, there are four classes, and they're called ecotropic, xenotropic, polytropic, and modified. And this is just, these are just diagrams of their genomes uh, for you to look at. The original words are based on host range that was determined a long time ago. Ecotropic, for example, means that these viruses will infect the mouse that they're made in, but not other animals. Uh, xenotropic means that the mouse that produces these viruses is not infected by it. Xenotropic viruses only infect other animals. Uh, mostly other non-rodent species, non-mouse species, but some mice apparently are susceptible. And polytropic retroviruses infect both the mouse and other species as well. So this was just an early classification used based on host range, which uh, is, is still used today. So the virus that we're talking about today is xenotropic, means it's not infecting the mouse that it's produced in, only other animals. So the, the pathogenesis of some of these ecotropic uh, viruses in mice, in, in some mouse strains like AKR, a lab strain, the mice die within a year of thymic lymphoma. And that's because these uh, viruses integrate next to a proto-oncogene. So what happens was when the mice are born, they are infected by an ecotropic virus. And then eventually they die within a year of thymic lymphoma induced by this virus, just to give you an idea of some of the pathogenesis of some of these viruses. Uh, xenotropic MLVs were discovered in the 70s as retroviruses from mice that could replicate in rat or human cells, but not in mice. That's the definition of xenotropic. The receptor is called XPR1, and the mouse gene is mutated so that this XPR1 cannot serve as a receptor for xenotropic viruses in them. So that's why the mice are not infected. They have apparently evolved uh, a mutated form of the receptor that prevents infection. But XPR gene of most mammals, including us, is permissive for xenotropic virus infection. So because of this receptor block in mice, there's not a lot of virus produced in mice. They have a few PFU maybe in them because the virus cannot spread. But if you take a human tumor and put it in a mouse, which is a common practice to try and grow the tumor and perhaps make a cell line, that human tumor will be infected by xenotropic murine leukemia virus. It's a beautiful way of recovering viruses from the mice because the human tumor cells are totally permissive for virus replication. And this was, this was learned a long time ago, and people were isolating viruses from these human tissues, and they said, ah, new human tumor viruses, but they were just mouse viruses being recovered. So they were called rumor viruses, not tumor viruses. Some more facts on xenotropic MLVs. They're inherited, of course, as endogenous proviruses. Ten, about 10 to 20 copies in all inbred mice strains. Uh, in some wild subspecies, there's more proviruses. Some of them are infectious and produce virus. And as I said, they can infect virtually all mammals except some musk species. Uh, in mice, they're not directly pathogenic. And we don't know really what they do in other species, although we'll, we'll see an experiment today where we address that. They're a common contaminant, as I've said. Uh, and uh, related ecotropic MLVs cause a variety of diseases in mice, as we have said. 
So where did this XMRV come from that we've isolated from prostate tumor DNA? Um, so these patients were from different parts of the U.S. And you'll see some other patients later on also in diverse parts of the U.S., which suggest maybe limited point sources because there's so little variation in the virus. Maybe this is a fairly recent event because there's not much sequence variation. This, these human isolates are very similar to XMR, X, uh, xenotropic MLVs in mice. Now, in the genome of a common mouse strain, uh, we don't find XMRV, but when these studies were first done, not many mouse strains had been examined for these sequences. So the question is, is the virus endogenous in any uh, lab strain? So here is again a sequence lineup between these patient samples. You see prostate cancer here, very closely related to murine leukemia viruses. And so what happens in mice, this is just a theoretical idea for how it got into people. So mice make exogenous uh, murine retroviruses, the ecotropic viruses, for example. They can infect mice. Um, these eventually become endogenized, so they integrate into the genome. And these mice live with these infections for many years. Eventually, the mice uh, so are selected for a receptor mutation, which makes them resistant so they don't get disease. And now we have xenotropic MLVs. These mice make virus, but they can't be infected by it, although the, the virus can spread to other species. So the idea is that one of these kinds of viruses somehow infected people. And the question is, was there one case of the virus going from a mouse to people? Or were there multiple incidents? Was there any human-to-human -human transmission? We don't have any answers to these questions from what I've told you so far. So I just want to tell you about some studies where they have looked in the mouse genome to see if there's a related virus. So again, we start with XMRV, the virus isolated from prostate tumors. You make primers that will detect it in the mouse genome. And this is an example of how you can use PCR to specifically look for XMRV. It turns out that XMRV has a 24 nucleotide deletion right here, which is unique. And so you can design PCR primers that span it and are therefore going to amplify specifically XMRV in mouse DNA. All right? You want to do this because there are lots of related sequences in the mouse genome, and you don't want to see those. You just want to see XMRV. So this was done uh, in, in a number of laboratories, and these are some of the mouse DNAs that were tested for XMRV. Um, of course, mus musculus is, a, is the, the origin of many lab strains, which are shown here. Some of these may look familiar to you, BALB-C, C57 black. Uh, then there are many substrains as well of mus musculus. All of these were looked at. Then there are different strains, Spritus, uh, Cook Eye, etc., uh, Dunny, and then it was also looked for in rat cells and a variety of other cells as well. And so what was found was that uh, inbred mice of all those strains contain about 10 to 20 xenotropic viruses related to XMRV, but none of them, the ones that were looked at, contain a single provirus with the exact sequences of XMRV. That is the virus that we got from prostate tumors. So none of these mouse strains have XMRV. They have related xenotropic viruses, but not XMRV. So it's not likely that any of those viruses in the mice were the immediate source of XMRV. So what is thought is that these results mean that there was a single cross-species transmission, sometimes recently, and then the virus adapted to humans, so it became different. You know, it's different from the endogenous XMRV, XMLVs. Uh, so that's one idea. Or maybe there is an endogenous provirus in mice which hasn't been detected yet, and that could have led to XMRV infection. Okay? So remember, this is a retrovirus. It infects cells. The RNA is converted to DNA. The DNA goes in the nucleus, and it integrates and forms a proviral DNA. You remember that this integration step is an obligatory step in retrovirus replication. It rep the virus cannot replicate without integrating. So a very good test of whether, in fact, a cell is infected with a retrovirus is to find the integration site in the chromosomal DNA. All right? So you could take DNA from these prostate tumors and ask, 
is their integrated retroviral DNA. So what was done before was to take RNA from these tumors and make DNA from it. All right? That doesn't tell you that it's integrated. Now remember, when you, when you integrate a retroviral genome, there's a host target. The host target sequences are duplicated, and you lose some retrovirus sequence. So you can tell a retrovirus integration site. If you sequence across the integration site, across the retrovirus into the cell DNA, you can tell that it's retroviral because of these features. So this is, yes? Could you check for protein expression? So in the prostate sections, that's what they did. But it doesn't prove that there's an integrated provirus, which is really a more gold standard proof of infection than finding protein. Yeah. Yes? So, so what are the features that you said the way you You lose two you lose nucleotides from either end of the retroviral sequence and then you duplicate the target site in the host DNA that, that it's integrated into. So this is the host target, this pink sequence here, and you can see it's duplicated on either side. And then these two, pro these two terminal bases are lost in the virus. The TT and the, AE, the AA are gone. All right? So you see that, and you can tell it's an integration site. All right, so then this was looked at in this paper in uh, October 2008. Integration site preference of XMRV, uh, a new retrovirus associated with prostate cancer. So what they did is they took DNA from prostate tumors. They cloned out nine XMRV integration sites from nine patients. Actually, I think there are more than nine. There are nine patients. I think there are 14 integration sites from nine patients. And they sequenced them. And they found there's no integration near oncogenes, which they wanted to see, because that would be how it would cause prostate cancer. And there's no integration near a tumor suppressor gene, which might disrupt it. So here are just three examples of this to, to give you an idea of what the data look like. So on the top, here is one integration of XMRV. And um, so they sequence across one of these integration sites. And you can see where the virus begins, and it goes into cellular sequence. And you can just take the sequence you get and blast it against the genome sequence so you know exactly what chromosome this integration occurs and what genes are nearby. So for example, there's a CRED5 gene here, which encodes a transcription factor. That's one integration site. There's another one here within a gene, NFAT, and then another one here within a different gene. So in all cases, you can tell exactly where the integration has occurred. So this was thought to be good evidence that there is actual bona fide infection of prostate cells because an integration site der is derived by viral replication. Okay, so now, now after these studies came out, a number of people began to look in other areas of the world, in people with prostate tumors, to see if this virus is present because that's one of the first things you do. If you suspect the virus is causing a disease, you start looking in more cases and do some epidemiology. So here is the study from Germany, prevalence of XMRV in sporadic prostate cancer. So now we're not worried about the RNA cell mutation anymore. So they found, they looked at 105 tissue samples from people with non-familial prostate cancer. They found one positive for XMRV out of 105 using PCR. And they also found one in 70 in tissue samples of men without prostate cancer. So they concluded that at least in Germany, the XMRV is not associated uh, with prostate cancer. So that's November 2008, a couple of years after the original uh, story was published. Um, yes? I know, um, I listened to one of your blogs that XMRV is associated with chronic fatigue syndrome. Did they ever look at the like, effect of the um, that chronic Um, they, I have not, I'm not aware of any study that has attempted to make a correlation between the two diseases. No. We are, we're going to talk about this, the chronic fatigue syndrome results in a moment, but I've not, I don't know of any that, that attempt to do both. It's the same virus that's implicated in both, though. So this was a study in September 2009 from a group at uh, University of Utah, and one of the individuals there, Ila Singh, used to be up at Columbia. 
and she is a pathologist, and um, she looked at 233 prostate tumor sections. She's a pathologist and a virologist. Uh, 109 benign, 101 benign controls. She found the DNA by PCR in 6% of the tumors and in 2% of the controls. She also looked for protein. She found it in 23% of the tumors and in 4% of the controls. And in this study, in contrast to the first one, she found that the protein, the viral protein, is predominantly found in malignant cells, not the stromal cells, which are the non-malignant part of the sections. Okay. So this is a bit different, but she also is finding XMRV consistently in prostate tumor. So this is an example of a section of a prostate tumor. Uh, this has been stained with an antibody to one of the viral proteins. Now this antibody is made against XMRV virus. So Ela Singh propagated the virus and injected it into rabbits and made antibodies. So now this is the brown staining is where the antibody is reacting with proteins. And these are all malignant uh, epithelial cells in the prostate section. And the stroma, which is marked with an S here, is not staining. So this makes more sense in terms of the tumor. The, the actual malignant cells are now expressing the viral protein. Okay, so another study in October of 2009, um, this from another uh, German cohort of patients, lack of evidence for XMRV in German prostate cancer patients. They looked at 589 prostate samples and 146 serum samples from people with prostate cancer, and they found no XMRV by PCR and no antibodies uh, by ELISA in any of the serum. So again, this is a German study, so uh, they, they said maybe there are some geographical restrictions on where this virus. So subsequently, many studies have been done in, in many different areas looking for the presence of this virus or vir viral sequence or antibodies to it in a variety of prostate cancer patients. And these are the studies that find the virus in PC. Uh, the original one from UCSF, 9 of 86. Um, this is the one from Ela Singh at University of Utah. And then there were two others uh, showing positivity in, in patients from the U.S., 11 of 40 positive for antibody in this study, 7 positive for PCR, and here 32 of 144 in the U.S. positive by PCR. But mostly there, there are many studies now that find very little or new, no XMRV in prostate cancer specimens. You can see them here from various countries around the world, Europe, uh, Asia, Central America, U.S. So this one in particular, zero out of 800 prostate tumor sections. This one was done at the NCI. At the same time, in July of uh, 2009, a paper was published saying, entitled Multiple Integrated Copies of XMRV in a cell line called 22RV1. So remember that. Not that I'm going to ask you on an exam, but it'll come up later. 22RV1 is a cell line derived from a human prostate tumor. And so they found that the virus that is produced by this human cell line is basically XMRV. It, it's the same virus that has already been found in prostate tumors. That's, that's what we're talking about. This cell line was produced by taking a piece of a human tumor and injecting it into a nude mouse, a mouse without an immune system. It's called xenotransplantation. The purpose is to grow up the tumor. They pass it from mouse to mouse and eventually make a cell line out of it, and that's this cell line, 22RV1. So the sequence of that virus is nearly identical to the XMRV that's been isolated from prostate tumors. And the authors conclude, quote, we conclude that the 22RV1 virus is XMRV and is not a mouse xenotropic virus acquired during passage of the cells in culture or in mice. So they said, yeah, this is XMRV. It's not, it's not a mouse xenotropic virus. So this is an interesting observation. This cell line, which is derived from a prostate tumor, is making the same virus that's isolated with patients. So this, is, at the time, was viewed as support for the idea, the etiology of uh, this virus in prostate cancer, because it's isolated from a prostate tumor. All right, so now we move on to a different disease, and this is a paper published in October of 2009 by a group in Nevada uh, working at an institute. It's actually a collaboration, but the, in Nevada there's an institute 
uh, which is, uh, has a high focus on patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. So they found XMRV in blood cells of patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. This is a collaboration between the group at Nevada. Uh, the Silverman is from Cleveland Clinic, and he originally was involved in the prostate tumor study. And then there are also some individuals from the National Cancer Institute on this paper. So let's talk a little bit about this disease. Chronic fatigue syndrome has a number of names. You'll see it CFS, CFIDS, ME, myalgic, myalgic encephalitis, uh, cr chronic fatigue, immune dysfunction syndrome, unknown etiologies, estimated 17 million cases globally, although there are various numbers you will find. Big problem with this disease, there's no way to diagnose it very readily. There's no laboratory test. You have to do patient interviews and apply criteria uh, and decide whether a patient has this disease or not. It's some of the characteristics include severe uh, incapacitating fa fatigue, not improved by rest, and certain symptoms lasting at least six months, sleep difficulties, problem with concentration, short-term memory, joint pain, muscle pain, tender lymph nodes, sore throat, and headache, post-exertional malaise, and about a quarter of the patients are fully disabled and unable to work. And there's a pattern of relapse with this disease. It can become better and then it can go away. So we have relapse and remission. It's, it's also characterized by a low-grade immune upregulation, poorly functioning NK cells. There are also some uh, CNS abnormalities and problems with metabolism. And what has been observed over the years of study of this disease is that there are a lot of latent infections with various herpes viruses, particularly EBV and CMV, and also some enteroviruses and other non-viral uh, microbes may trigger it. So this group in uh, Nevada decided to look at uh, whether these patients contained XMRV because there was some suggestion that um, RNA-L it was, was different in certain patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. So they saw, oh, RNA cell has been associated with a virus in prostate cancer, so let's look in these patients. So this institute in Nevada had a large repository of patient samples, so they took the blood uh, cells from these, made DNA from them, and did PCR. So this is PCR using peripheral blood mononuclear cell nucleic acids using primers specific for this virus, XMRV. So you can see that a good fraction of the Samples are positive for either the gag or the envelope gene of the virus. So these are individual patient samples. And they also compared normal controls. So you can see the, there is one positive on this set of normal controls here. So 68 out of 101 CFS patients were positive by PCR and 8 out of 218 normal controls. So they sequenced the virus and it's up here in red, XMRV. And the virus from this study has WPI uh, in front of it, as opposed to VP62 and 42, which are the samples from the original prostate tumor uh, study. And these are identical, same virus, maybe one or two or a few amine, uh, nucleotide differences. So they're on a phylogenetic tree. They're all up together here. And again, they're very related to the xenotropic viruses, which are shown here, and less so to the polytropic and, and modified polytropic viruses on this tree. I want to show you just a few experiments which they did to uh, characterize um, <clears throat> the serology of this infection. So up here on the upper left is, is flow cytometry where they take uh, peripheral blood cells from either healthy people or uh, a number of cases of individuals with chronic fatigue syndrome and they sort these cells in a flow cytometer and they use uh, antibodies against another retrovirus, not XMRV, but they use antibodies against, again, spleen-focused forming virus. Remember, that was an antibody used in the first study because it reacts with a lot of xenotropic murine uh, retroviruses. And you can see the normal uh, blood peripheral mononuclear cells don't shift to the right when you add these antibodies, but then the blood of, the, of the, all, all five patients here the peripheral blood cells shift to the right, which means they're reacting with these antibodies. So it tells you that there are uh, some retroviral proteins being expressed uh, in these blood cells. They also did a variety of other experiments, including Western blots. They would culture these peripheral blood cells in, vit in vitro with susceptible cells, 
and then they would do Western blots on the extracts. And you can see they can detect viral protein envelope and gag proteins on Western blot using antibodies to either, again, spleen-focused forming virus or a, a another uh, murine leukemia virus. And that's what most of these studies are. They also found that the uh, viral proteins were in CD4 positive uh, T cells and in B cells. And they were able to culture this virus by mixing, again, peripheral blood mononuclear cells from patients with a cell line that is susceptible to the virus. So that allows you to amplify the virus that's present. And you can see the viral particles uh, here. And they're very much like the viruses that are made by transfecting cells with the XMRV clone. Uh, and finally, they showed that a number of patients, 9 of 18 patients, have antibodies to the virus. So for this, they do another flow cytometry experiment, except the cells used here, the cells that are sorted, are not blood cells from the patients, but they are a lab cell line that express retroviral glycoproteins on their surface. So then you add serum from the patients, and you ask, does that serum react with these envelope-expressing cells? All right. So here we have normal sera, normal plasma from a patient without the disease. And then you have here a, a plasma, sorry, this is a, another control. Sorry, this is another s sample of a patient uh, where the, they are reacting with um, spleen focus forming virus expressing cells. So this tells you that the sera have antibodies that cross react with spleen focus forming proteins. Again, it's not XMRV, it's a related virus. So the patients appear to have virus in their peripheral blood mononuclear cells, and they also appear to have antibodies in their blood. Okay, so to summarize that up, uh, we have a, another association between XMRV and a different disease, chronic fatigue syndrome. Again, is it a causal factor or a passenger? We don't know from this study. We have to do much more epidemiology and basic research to answer that. In this study, there was no correlation with the RNA cell genotype. So that was what led them into doing this, but there isn't a correlation between whether or not you find XMRV and the mutation in RNA cell. The other point that is interesting is that they found the, the virus sequence present in 3.7% of healthy blood donors. So if you extrapolate that across the U.S., that means there are several million people, theoretically, that have this virus in them. So immediately this became a concern for the blood supply, whether the virus is present and whether we should worry about that. So you can imagine that that would be an issue. So um, a number of other studies rapidly followed. This one, September 2010. This is from the NIH. And here they again took blood from patients with chronic fatigue syndrome and healthy donors, and they did PCR. And they found viral sequences in this study, but they weren't XMRV. Uh, these were polytropic uh, MLVs. These are a different uh, tropism group than the xenotropic ones. So they found these sequences, and we'll call them MLV-like sequences, in 32 of, of 37 CFS patients and 3 of 44 healthy controls. They had some paired samples from patients 15 years apart, so they were able to test those, and 7 of 8 of those were still positive. And as I said, these are more related to polytropic MLV, so it's not, it's not XMRV, it's, it's different, and there's more sequence diversity. So if you do a phylogenetic tree of the envelope and gag sequences, you see uh, XMRV that we've been talking about is right here. Here's the CFS sequences, WPI and VP62, the prostate sequences. Here are some murine endogenous uh, retroviruses, and here are the sequences found in this study. So they're, they're tracking with uh, polytropic or, mo or modified polytropic retroviruses of mice here and also here compared uh, with XMRV. So this was puzzling because it was a very different virus. It's a marine retrovirus, but it's not XMRV. So it's, it was strange that a different virus would be found in the same types of patients. And here's a summary then of all the studies that followed looking at XMRV in patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. So we have the original study, uh, which I first described in the US. These are patients in the Nevada area. 
uh, actually they are patients from different parts of the US. And then the uh, second study which we just described also US patients, 32 out of 37 positive. But there have been many that find little or no virus in patient samples. And these go from the UK, the US, China, Germany, and Japan. And you can see the numbers, most of them are PCR based. There's a little bit of serology involved as well. The most recent one looked both by uh, PCR and serology. They also attempted to grow virus from the cells in a similar way as the original study reported, but didn't find any of it. <clears throat> While this is all going on, uh, this group, uh, Ela Singh's group and a couple of others, looked to see if any of the uh, AIDS antiviral drugs could inhibit XMRV. So this, pub this paper is an example. Raltegravir is an inhibitor of um, XMRV. So this is a, uh, by a, a drug that is used to treat uh, HIV infections. It's an integrase inhibitor. It's also a potent inhibitor of XMRV. And this is a table summarizing the different HIV drugs that are active against H uh, XMRV. There are reverse transcriptase inhibitors and two integration inhibitors. So immediately, there are a number of patients with this syndrome in the US, immediately a number of them began taking these drugs off-label. So the HIV antivirals are FDA approved for use for treating AIDS, but any prescription drug can be prescribed off-label for another use by a physician. That's legal. And so a number of these patients have been treating, getting treatment in this way for uh, this disease. So taking it for chronic fatigue syndrome, assuming that XMRV is the etiologic agent. And another study was published uh, shortly after that where they infected rhesus macaques with the virus. So they took five animals and they put virus intravenously into these animals. The animals develop a transient viremia and then they become chronically infected for long periods, as you would expect from a retrovirus infection. Uh, the virus, go, the viremia goes away after a month and then nine months later they detected it again. So there's periods of inactivity and activity. The uh, viral proteins were widely disseminated in monkey tissues, but in very specific cell types, T cells, again, which is one of the cell types found in the CFS study, uh, macrophages, epithelial cells, and they also found extensive replication uh, in the prostate. So a lot of these properties of infection are somewhat consistent with what we see in people. And so a reporter asked me, does this mean that the virus causes chronic fatigue syndrome. So you have to be very careful when you have animal results that mimic what you see in people because it doesn't prove that the virus is causing the same disease. You can only do that by really good epidemiology and eventually getting an inhibitor and showing that it clears the disease, an inhibitor of the virus and showing that it clears the disease. Now, we had a series of papers published at the beginning of this year. Four papers we're going to talk about right now came out in this journal, Retrovirology. The first one entitled, Mouse DNA Contamination in Human Tissue Tested for XMRV. So in this study, it was a study of UK CFS patients. They found XMRV by PCR in 4.8% of prostate cancers. I'm sorry, I said CFS. This is prostate cancers. All of these positives were also positive for mouse DNA, contaminating mouse DNA, all right? And they also had XMRV negatives, 20%. These were also, 20% of those were positive for mouse DNA. So mouse DNA, remember, has related sequences in it. Mouse genomes have 10 to 20 copies of integrated xenotropic viruses. So uh, this said, basically, you have to be really careful because in many labs, there are mouse sequences present if you work on mice. And one of the authors of this study, John Coffin, said, he gives talks on this and he shows a slide of mice crawling over a scale in a laboratory. So he said, at night, how do you know what happens in your lab? Mice can come and contaminate your stuff. If you leave your buffers open, they can go into them. So he feels that mouse DNA is perver pervasive and that you have to be really careful. So he said, this doesn't mean the previous studies were contaminated, but it just tells you that you have to be really careful uh, when you do this type of stuff. 
Uh, another study came out of Japan, an endogenous murine leukemia viral genome contaminant in a commercial reverse transcriptase PCR kit. So they found that certain kits that you buy to do PCR, some of them have an antibody in them. It's called hot start to start the PCR reaction. These are mouse monoclonal antibodies. They're contaminated with mouse DNA. So you can get positive XMRV PCR reactions if you use those kits. So they said, okay, this doesn't mean that the previous studies were compromised, but um, you have to be really careful. That's the second paper. Third one, contamination of human DNA with mouse can lead to false detection of XMRV-like sequences. This was a CFS study uh, from the U.S. Again, DNA from 112 CFS patients, 36 healthy controls. The few XMRV positives also had mouse DNA in it. So that they were positive because they had mouse DNA. So they actually developed a highly sensitive assay for detecting mouse DNA in samples. And um, they suggest this be used in any study of the etiology of, of CFS or prostate cancer. So John Coffin says, PCR is so sensitive. If you took a drop of mouse blood and put it in a swimming pool, in a 30,000 gallon swimming pool, uh, and then you took a mill of, you mixed it up, took a mill of swimming pool water, you could detect uh, XMRV or XML related DNA in the DNA from that drop because PCR is so sensitive. So this is why he says mice are everywhere and they can contaminate uh, all kinds of samples. I think we probably have mouse nucleic acid in our water if you think about it. It comes from reservoirs upstate, right? The mice are up there and it's not filtered, so there's actually probably a low level of mouse nucleic acids in water that you use in the laboratory as well. The fourth study that came out in the same journal, February 2011, disease-associated sequences are consistent with laboratory contamination. They also found that mouse DNA can contaminate patient samples, but they also sequenced the XMRV from that prostate tumor cell line. Remember 22RV1? It's a, made by passing a human cell, a prostate tumor through mice, they sequenced this virus and they sequenced multiple isolates and said the variation they found in just all the viruses they sequenced from the cell line is greater than all the variation in, observed in the human isolates from prostate cancer and from chronic fatigue syndrome. And so they said this isn't consistent with a process of transmission among humans. The virus should vary more. It's more likely to be contamination. So I read these papers and a reporter from the Chicago Tribune called me and she asked me your question, what do you think? And I said, I think this is the beginning of the end. And then uh, that was published the same day and all these patients started emailing and posting on my blog and I went back and looked and in fact, none of this means that the original studies are wrong. So I said, yeah, I was premature at the time, but let's move on. Okay, now a few, a little bit later, just next month, the same group, Greg Tower, same journal, published analysis of integration sites from prostate cancer tissue suggests PCR contamination. So you remember at the beginning I talked about using integration as the gold standard for retrovirus infection of cells. So what Greg did was he took the sequences that uh, were published of the XMR integration sites in prostate tumor DNA. And he found that two of the 14 integration site sequences are identical to sites cloned in the same lab from a cell line infected with XMRV. So in the, in the, lo in the lab that had prepared the prostate DNA for integration experiments, they had also worked with this cell line, which is a prostate tumor cell line. They had infected it with XMRV and had analyzed the integration sites in that cell line, and they published them. And what they found in this group was that the prostate sequences, the integration sites, were the same for two of the integration sites between the cell line and the prostate tumor. Okay, so this never happens. You never get identical retroviral integration sites in a cell line versus a, another cell line or a tumor. So they said that these sites are a result of PCR contamination. In other words, when the DNA was prepared from the prostate DN tumors, in Cleveland, maybe, it was contaminated with DNA from this cell line, which already had integrated retroviruses in it. 
So contamination can explain it. Whether it actually does is not clear because the other 12, we don't know whether they're contaminants or not or bona fide integration sites. So this is currently being looked at uh, as I understand. Finally, not too long ago, there was a conference um, in Boston, the 18th conference on retroviruses and opportunistic infections. And a group from uh, NCI published, uh, presented the finding that XMRV probably originated via recombination between two endogenous marine retroviruses while the human tumor was being passed through mice to make this cell line, 22RV1. So what they did is they sequenced mouse strain DNA and they found precursors to XMRV in two different strains of mice. They call them pre-XMRV1 and pre-XMRV2. And these two proviruses, the idea is you, they put the human prostate tumor into a nude mouse strain, was then infected by the viruses in the mice, and then the two viruses recombined to produce XMRV. And you can actually do the recombination of these two sequences right in front of you. You could take the sequence and, and mix it up, and you produce exact XMRV from these two precursors. Okay, so is that clear? These are from mice. These are two precursors that recombined to produce XMRV. So they feel, now I don't have the paper yet describing this. I was hoping it would be published in time for this, but it's not out yet. Uh, so we can't go over the details. But um, their idea is that this virus arose in the 22RV1 cell line, a number of years, early 90s, and it has contaminated all the studies of XMRV in prostate cancer and chronic fatigue syndrome. And we only have a handful of XMRV sequences from human specimens, and they're all identical to this virus. If we had more diverse sequences, then it would support perhaps the idea that this virus is involved, but we don't have those. A number of individuals have said they exist, but they haven't been published. So at the end, what do we know and what don't we know? What's the role in these diseases? Is it a cause of the disease? Is it a passenger? Is it coincidence? We don't know how many people are actually infected with this virus. We don't know how it's transmitted. It's probably originated from mice. Um, if it, in fact, is infecting people, as I said, one group believes that it's all a laboratory contaminant, but whether it infects people remains to be really seen. Um, one of the problems that I have is that some of the observations don't make sense epidemiologically. For example, the first study of XMRV in CFS patients, they only found XMRV. And then the other one I told you about from the NCI, they only found polytropic MLV. And these patients are collected over many years from different areas of New England. So why would the type of virus associated with CFS segregate according to the laboratory, not according to, say, geographic area or some other distribution. Why would a lab, one lab find MLV and the other find XMRV? So it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, as I said, there might be more diverse XMRV out there, but it hasn't been published. So, so far, all the XMRV looks just like it was made in the 22RV1 uh, cell line. But some other possibilities that still are out there, there could be pockets of local infection that account for these results. Um, contamination, as I said, might, res might result in these findings. Now, a lot of, um, that when, these, when this conference finding was um, put on the web last month, uh, a lot of patients asked, okay, if this is a contaminant, why do I have antibodies against the virus? And the, you can actually, there is a commercial test now that will detect antibodies to the virus in your serum. But that's why I spent a long time telling you about how the tests are, are run. None of those tests tell you that the antibodies are specific for XMRV. They just say they are detecting a related virus. So the patients may have, be positive for XMRV, but they may be antibodies against a different retrovirus. So in fact, it may be that there are infections, common infections with mouse retroviruses in people, 
And so some of us have antibodies, but maybe it doesn't cause any disease. We don't, we don't really know. So cross-reactive antibodies may explain uh, the, a lot of the serology. Yes? Drugs, yeah. yeah do, they feel better? do the patients feel better? You know, that, this is anecdotal, and so it's not even worth considering. So, I don't know, maybe there are 100 people in the U.S. taking such antivirus. You can find blogs where they talk about it, but it's not controlled because you want to feel better if you take these, right? So, and as many uh, scientists have said, the only way you can find if an antiviral is effective is to, to do a properly controlled clinical study. You can't do anecdotal, I feel better types of studies. And these people who take it, even if they did all feel better, that information would be useless because you can't license a drug based on that, right? So, you know, there's been a lot of argument about whether this should be happening. And I mean, a lot of the patients are, are frustrated because they've been sick for a long time and they want to feel better. So they want to take drugs. But you cannot use that to, dr to drive any decisions about therapy. So one of the things that uh, Vincent talked about that you should think about is that in patients with diseases such as HIV, there are large serum loads of virus. There's a lot of virus there. And you can detect that easily. And there's a correlation mystery of whether or not there's any efficacy in treating the drug and prevalence of virus is they're not congruent and you have a lot of trouble putting that together in any kind yeah. of study. So, yeah, so all the evidence so far has been PCR and the only paper where there, any virus was detected was the very first one from the Nevada study where they took lymphocytes and put them in culture with a susceptible cell line and then they were able to grow out virus, but that could be a contamination. So you don't have any measure of viral load in these patients, which is what you would need, right? So actually, it's interesting to look at how the AIDS epidemic progressed in this sense to get a sense for how long it takes. So you remember from our talk about AIDS, 1980 were the first clusters of unusual infections suggesting that something was going on and two years later multi-city case control studies provided evidence for spread of an agent causing these infections okay. good epidemiology by 1983 there were a thousand AIDS cases documented uh, the virus wasn't isolated till July of 1984 so these documented cases are purely from various infections uh, opportunistic infections uh, so the virus is 1984, and the first antibody tests February of 85. And then you can start looking at populations and saying, do people with the disease have the virus? And then you get the information you need. Not even at that point yet uh, with XMRV, where you can have a reliable test, because we're not sure where to look. It's not clear that the blood is the right place to look. And then in 1987, uh, AZT, the first antiviral, was approved uh, by the FDA. So. Now, and then heart came many years later, 1995. So at the minimum, seven years it took in the 1980s with pretty good technology. And this is because there is a lot of virus present and the diagnosis is very clear. So uh, we're only, was the first example, the first isolation in 2006, so we're five years down and we still haven't decided whether this is the etiologic agent or not. But I think, so if you want my opinion, it's not looking good, but I don't think the story is over. In fact, there are a couple of papers uh, in press that are going to sort this out. There's a large study going on at Columbia um, that's going to sort it out. Uh, the, and you're going to know in the next two weeks, basically, all right? So they're going to be published in various good journals, and they will answer the question of whether this virus is causing a disease or not, whether it's infecting people. But the whole story for the last five years has been amazing to watch. It's developed. This is why I wanted to tell you this story, because it's developing right in front of us. I've been following it from the start. 
and it's, you can see what it takes to say that a virus causes a human disease. And not only the science, but you get to see how the scientists get involved. So the group in Nevada who originally found this um, have been the most ardent supporters of the idea that the virus is causing the disease, but they have only published the one paper and nothing else has come out of that. And they have said at various meetings that they have a lot of more evidence, they have more sequence variation, but it's never been published. So rule, rule number one, you have to publish your data, otherwise no one can ever use it. There's also been a lot of conflict among the scientists because as you can see, there are people who find the virus and people who don't. So at various meetings, lots of accusations and the patients now are getting involved because the internet makes all of this accessible in a way that wasn't the case even at the beginning of the AIDS epidemic. So they can see the results themselves online, they can go, they can blog about it, they can post comments. I'm a firm believer that in the end, science always figures out what's right. Not scientists, science does. And that's because you have an interesting question and eventually the science will come to the right conclusion. But you can't trust individual scientists because there are all kinds of agendas. So trust science. If you remember one thing from me, trust science, not scientists. Now we have one more lecture Monday by Dixon de Pommier. It's, he's great, very entertaining. So please do come and, uh, and listen to, about West Nile. <laughs>